Hello, and welcome to the Google for Entrepreneurs Hangout series in partnership with Virgin Unite. I am Adora Chung, co-founder of Homejoy, and I'm thrilled to welcome some amazing leaders in startup fundraising. We'll be discussing crowdfunding, seed funding, and accelerators today with an emphasis on tactical advice you can take with you when raising your funds for your startup organization. Please join us on social. We're using the hashtag RaiseYourRound, so please join us in conversation on Google Plus and Twitter. And warm welcome to everyone tuning in today, especially to our friends at the Branson Centers of Entrepreneurship. Throughout the Hangout, we'll be taking some questions submitted by those entrepreneurs and by users submitting questions through Google Plus and Twitter. So without further ado, let's get right to it. I'd like to introduce our guest today. First, please welcome Danae Ringelman. Danae co-founded Indiegogo in 2008 with a mission to democratize fundraising and has since helped propel the company into the world's largest funding platform. Today, as Indiegogo's chief development officer, she's focused on driving total customer satisfaction and steering the company's employee culture and value initiatives. She's listed as Fast Company's top 50 women innovators in technology and was named one of Fortune's 40 under 40. She will talk about crowdfunding for startups, discussing the current state of crowdfunding and offering tips folks can leverage to make successful campaigns. Welcome, Danae. Thanks for having me. No problem. And next up is Dave McClure. Dave is a venture capitalist and founding partner at 500 Startups, an internet startup seed fund and incubator program headquartered in Silicon Valley with over $125 million under management. 500 Startups has been an investor in hundreds of companies all over the world, including MakerBot, Twilio, Wildfire Interactive, SendGrid, and Credit Karma, and Homejoy as well, among others. Dave has been a software developer, entrepreneur, marketer, blogger, and investor in Silicon Valley for over 25 years and has worked with companies such as PayPal, Founders Fund, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twilio, Mint.com, Simply Hired, O'Reilly Media, Intel, and Microsoft. Thank you for joining us, Dave. Thanks for having me. Good morning. Great. Let's jump right in. I uh, wanted to start off with a general conversation about startup fundraising, um, in particular pre-Series A fundraising. Homejoy raised about $2 million three years ago um, from, in, from Angels, and we um, landed folks who in particular were um, very excited about the space that we're in, home services, as well as had good track records. So for both of you, how do you go about receiving your early rounds of funding pre-Series A, and what do you look for when choosing your investors? Maybe start with Dave. Um, uh, I guess uh, what uh, founders should look for uh, in what investors. Mean investors. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think when you're starting out, you probably want to uh, see if you can find investors who have an understanding for your business and the customers you're going to work with. Uh, hopefully, that investor has some experience uh, in that you know area or space. Um, but sometimes you will also just take money from people who are willing to believe in what you're doing and are willing to bet on you. Uh, Danae, what about yourself? Sure, and I'll speak both as an entrepreneur who raised venture funding as well as someone who started a company that helps people raise money. Um, so for ourselves, uh, we, we found that we actually didn't resonate with any traditional investors, uh, VCs or angels, until we actually proved that our, our model was working. When we created Indiegogo, it was a whole new way of raising money on the internet. It had never been done before. We were essentially creating an industry. So we weren't a better, faster, cheaper version of anything. We were a whole new way of doing something. And so it was a lot of risk there for traditional investors because they had nothing to compare us to. Um, so in order for us to attract that investment, we actually had to prove case studies and prove growth and traction. Um, bootstrapping on our own. I always like to say if I had Indiegogo when I started Indiegogo, it would have taken a little, <laughs> a little less time to get going. Um, but then if I flip to the Indiegogo perspective, when, when people use Indiegogo to raise money, it's actually, you're not actually giving up equity. You're offering perks in exchange for funding. Um, so really what it is, is it's an exercise of going out to your customers and your, uh, your friends, your family, people in your network, um, and, and, and enlisting them and getting them excited about your idea. And so uh, when you're thinking about who your funders are going to be, they're the exact same people as who your customers are going to be. So the crowdfunding experience is as much a funding exercise as well as a marketing exercise. Got it. And what do you think about, um, Goretti from Google Plus asks, what do you think about taking an investment from friends and family? Um, I'll, I'll jump in here. Uh, <laughs> If, I, we, if we had had that option, we, we probably would have. <laughs> um, unfortunately, um, my co-founders and I were not in that situation. And so 
uh, we had uh, all of us had worked for several years before starting a company and I always knew growing up that I wanted to start something I didn't know what that was going to be uh, the way I put it is I always wanted to be my own boss um, so when I worked uh, when I was working in the working world as having a job um, I was just saving as much money as I possibly could and it was from those savings that myself and my co-founders were able to last um, as, as long as possible. Mm -hmm. um, if you have if you have friends and family that uh, truly believe in what you're doing, um, I would connect with them. I would you know speak to them about what your vision is, what you're trying to accomplish. Disclose all the risks. There's no guarantee that it's actually going to happen. But I do know from from actually running Indiegogo, um, there's a lot of reasons people like to fund fund ideas and fund businesses and it and those ideas span beyond just profit. Um, people want to put their money where their mouth is, where their heart is. They want to support people they care about. They want to participate in something bigger than themselves. And so there's all different kinds of motivations and those could be the motivations for your friends and family and I would just be upfront about what the risks are and let them know it's not a guarantee but then let them be part of the ride. Makes sense. And as an yeah. entrepreneur, what advice do you give for others that are not sure if they're ready for investment? Um, that, that's a great question. I would say uh, if, if, if there's entrepreneurs who are not sure they're ready for investment, I would first flip that question on themselves and say, are you ready to, to start a business? Uh, because a business is it's, it's, it's a full-on experience. Um, there, it's a lot of navigation. There's no guarantee. There's a lot of uncertainty, and there's a lot of um, you know things you have to navigate. And of which one of those is finding finding money to help you do what you want to go do. Uh, so I would actually ask yourself first: Are you ready to jump in? Are you ready for you know at least a few years of uh, no not knowing if it's going to pan out? I think one of the best pieces of advice I got from uh, an advisor, actually Slava, my co-founder, got this advice, and then he shared it with my other co-founder and I and that individual had said look when you're starting a company you just don't know for two years if you're really onto something mm -hmm. so you just have to, to keep trying keep iterate keep learning keep pivoting uh, for at least two years um, and give yourself that time to experiment um, until you know if you're really onto something and because of that advice it gave us some breathing room and it let me obsess a little bit less about feeling like I had to know if it was working or not right away got it um, Dave so Mebs from Google Plus has this question for you. If a startup idea has potential for user growth but is not making money yet, for example, Instagram and WhatsApp, what are things you as an investor will consider to determine whether to invest? Well, I think for us, we tend to focus, for 500 startups, we tend to focus on companies where there is a little bit more of a clear business model. Uh, we have invested in companies that are just focused on user growth and not business models. Um, in those areas, we're probably looking for a substantial amount of usage already, um, usually measured in terms of at least probably 10 to 100,000 users and possibly even single-digit millions. Um, we also look at growth rates for the company. Um, you know, probably at least we would be looking for 10 to 10 percent or greater monthly growth rates. Um, I just wanted to mention a little bit about the question about taking investment from friends and family. Um, uh, a lot of what Danae said I think is also on target. Um, in the 90s I actually had a small business and I put about 100,000 of my own money mostly on credit card debt um, and then uh, eventually raised about 40 or 50,000 from some friends and family. Um, and it was really, you know, it was a little bit of a scary uh, ask, uh, both because I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to return money to those people and also, you know, whether they really had the money to risk or not. Uh, it ended up working out and us returning uh, about 2x to our, uh, to our investors eventually, but that wasn't clear for a while. Mm -hmm. um, but I what think one that? thing... Oh, yeah. What was that startup that you were doing? Uh, it was a company called Aslan Computing after the lion from uh, uh, the Chronicles of Narnia. <laughs> uh, but I was doing... It was mostly more of a consulting business. Um, and any given time, I guess, between 2 to 20 people we were, were working for us. Um, but I was really still learning a lot about running a business and a lot about investment. Uh, we had not raised money from venture capitalists. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of times where we needed to make payroll and I would have to do, you know, advances on a credit card or take it from savings. Uh, and at least at one point we, we did raise some capital from friends and family. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure I asked all the questions of my friends and family that Danae was suggesting. <laughs> um, 
But I think uh, probably one thing that's important is that you as uh, a founder are willing to put your own money in, you know, at least if you have some, before you ask that money from other people. Right. Makes sense. Um, so Branson Center South Africa asks for you, Dave, what are the three major founder traits that makes you want to invest in them? Hmm. Well, I think, you know, primary things we look for are really, you know, uh, passion or desire to solve problems for a certain type of customer or, you know, building a product. Um, we like to find founders who are a little bit crazy, but maybe not too crazy. <laughs> Um, and then in particular, we're looking for people with skills probably in product development, either coding or design, uh, and in marketing or sales. Um, what's really important for us is that people um, focus on the customer and the problem they're trying to solve, uh, not just on nerding out on the product. Uh, there's a lot of people who are really passionate about building products but may not understand who the customers are for those products. So, mm. And we actually... We want to see people who have uh, an understanding of who they're going to be selling to, and that also probably helps inform what they're building and how they sell. Got it. Cool. And um, and so, Five Hundred Startups is well known for making investments around the world. How does an entrepreneur located outside of Silicon Valley, um, and with a minimal investor network, initiate the fund funding raising process? And you know, where do they begin with? Begin from in, in general. Uh, well, for us, we would probably point people to AngelList as a great place to start. Um, actually, that's where we take our applications for our accelerator process. It's also where we look for information about companies. Uh, full disclosure, we're an investor in AngelList, but we actually think it's a great product, too. Um, so you can create a profile on your company and also on you and the other founders of the company. Um, that's angel.co. And then we have an application process for Accelerator that we run uh, pretty much every quarter on AngelList. Uh, we also have people in other parts of the world. So a lot of our staff is spread about eight to ten other countries. Uh, so we have people in Brazil, Mexico, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, China, Taiwan, uh, India, and the Middle East, uh, who are all looking for companies and startups uh, in different parts of the world. And from your experience, which countries do you see as the most up and coming in terms of VC dollars? Well, there's a pretty active uh, investment community that's been uh, operating in Southeast Asia just in the last couple of years. That's been really growing quite considerably. Uh, China itself, there's a huge amount of uh, investment going on there, uh, particularly with the successes of Alibaba and recently Xiaomi. Uh, I might say there's actually a, a little bit too much money running around in China. <laughs> um, uh, India very recently, I think with the Modi government coming into power um, and also companies like SoftBank making commitments to invest $10 billion in India. Um, very large companies like Snap, uh, Snapdeal and Flipkart in India raising money and being billion dollar entities. There's a lot of optimism for the future in places like India. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then other emerging markets, we've started to make investments in a bunch of places that maybe are a little unusual for people, but um, places like Turkey and Brazil definitely have vibrant economies and growing. Uh, Mexico, which is really right, uh, in some cases, closer than other places in the U.S., uh, has actually got a great um, entrepreneurial community. Mm -hmm. Got it. Cool. So let's, um, let's jump on the topic of crowdfunding, which, of course, Danae, that this is your area of expertise. <laughs> Um, so Lauren Pogson from Twitter asks, there are so many options for crowdfunding. How does one determine what's right for them? <laughs> okay, great. And just to actually go back to the question that uh, Dave was talking about, just from what we're seeing on, on Indiegogo, um, we are seeing campaigns come from every corner of the earth, every country of the world. We're distributing money to 70 countries every single week. So there's creativity and entrepreneurship um, absolutely everywhere, and our goal is to help unleash that even further. Um, I know we will have done our job if people stop seeing Silicon Valley as the center of entrepreneurship around the world, because I know it's not true. Uh, there just happens to be a lot of money here, which then draws the entrepreneurs, but there's entrepreneur spirit everywhere, and if we can kind of break down those barriers and unleash that further, then the traditional investors, like the VCs, will then go running after them, <laughs> change the dynamic. Um, so when you're thinking about crowdfunding, I, you know, a great place to start is just figure out, you know, 
again, it's, it's, it's a marketing exercise. Who is your customer? Where are they? Um, are, is it going to be a local, uh, local group of people that you're going to go after? Maybe you're starting a small business and it only will be relevant to you know, people within a certain city or place. Um, or are you building a product that will have a global audience? Um, Indiegogo and crowdfunding are right for both of those, but it will just require a different strategy uh, when, you, when you do do that. I think if, you're if, you, if you are ready to kind of test your hypotheses around who your customer is, uh, what your product is, what features you want, the pricing that you want to test, um, you're really ready for an Indiegogo or crowdfunding campaign um, because you can test all of those assumptions, all of those hypotheses um, through a campaign and you'll learn very quickly within a matter of weeks if you're, if you're meeting a true need or if there's more work that you need to do. Um, one of the benefits of, of, of what we offer on Indiegogo is that, um, first of all, um, there's flex funding and, and fixed funding, so many funding options, um, which allows you to you know, set your own goals and, and figure out what, what type of uh, campaign you want to run. The second is we offer things like perk swapping, where um, maybe, you, maybe you're building uh, the next uh, you know, medical device or health activity tracker and uh, you, you're, you've done a lot of user research, you've tested around with people you know and you're, you're honing in on what you think you, you want to offer and you've prototyped it and all that. Um, it's a, Indiegogo is a great way to actually go test to make sure that your hypotheses are the way they are and you know, test your features and test your, your pricing. We have, we have campaigns like the Misfit Shine, for example, that you know, they offered their activity tracker at a certain price point, it got sold out, and then they offered it again at a higher price point just to see if people were willing to pay at that higher price point and confirm if their pricing assumptions were correct. They also asked their funder base, which is, again, also their customers, mm -hmm. what else do you want to see? And a lot of them demanded ne necklaces and bracelets. Those, that was an accessory they hadn't even thought about adding, but rather than uh, guess if it's something that they, their customers actually wanted, they used Indiegogo as a way to prove it. And so they put up a perk mid-campaign, um, which you can do with perk swapping, and uh, allowed funders to validate that opinion or not, and it got claimed overnight. So they knew that this was actually something the audience wanted, not something the audience was saying they wanted. So it's a great way to test your assumptions. Um, also, if you are in the early stages of an idea and you haven't gotten the prototype or you haven't figured out all the you know, nitty gritty details, you can still do a, a crowdfunding campaign. Just set your, your goals a little bit more modestly. So maybe you're trying, if you're a filmmaker for example, and you want to make a film, maybe raise money just to make the trailer um, and use it as a test for if there's interest or appetite for, this, for the story to be told. But don't try to raise 100% of the budget at once uh, because it's still quite early. And again, just be, be transparent with your funders that this is what you're trying to achieve. You're trying to make the trailer, not the entire film. Great. That's pretty cool that people do price testing and testing mm -hmm. hypotheses. Um, yeah. So, some related, you touched on this a little bit, but what are some of the shared traits in the most successful crowdfunding campaigns you've seen on Indiegogo? Sure. Uh, so, there, we talk about uh, the three keys to success, and the first is uh, it starts with your campaign. Um, it doesn't end there, though. <laughs> a lot of, it's not a field of dreams, but what I mean by a great campaign is the most important element of having a great campaign is authenticity. Um, so that includes being honest about what you're trying to achieve, uh, but also why you're trying to achieve it and why you're the right person to do it. So this, it's, this is where it's really important to really speak from your heart and let that passion be, be shown as Dave was talking about earlier. Uh, we encourage people uh, to do a video because with a video we've seen campaigns rise on average 115% more than campaigns without a video and part of that video is putting yourself in there talking about again wh not just what you're trying to achieve but why you're trying to achieve it and what's the biggest impact in the world. The reason we say all that is because I kind of alluded to this earlier but we found that there's four reasons people fund anything on Indiegogo and we call them the four P's, uh, them being uh, people, uh, passion, participation, and perks. Uh, and people will fund for one or two or three or all four reasons. And so if they are funding because they want to support you, that's why it's important to put yourself in it. Um, if they're funding for passion because they believe in the impact too, that's why it's important to talk about that. Um, it's important to talk about you know, how, the, how the crowd will actually help get this idea made. That appeals to the participation motivation. And then offer really fun, unique perks, which could be your end product if that's what you're building, or something else that's unique um, to get people really, really excited. 
the second key to success, uh, beyond just having a great campaign that's you know personal and authentic, um, is being really proactive. Uh, so that's where uh, we, Indiegogo we consider ourselves an amplification engine. Whatever you put in, we amplify to get you, help you get more. So if you put zero in, we probably won't help you very much because we'll be amplifying zero effort. But if you put you know X in in terms of uh, effort and and getting it out to your audiences, we'll help you find uh, multiples of that. And that's through all the social integration technology, through a lot of our automated marketing things. Um, we've offered a new product called In Demand, which is now the ability to continue to raise money after your campaign has ended, which a lot of especially product-based uh, campaigns find incredibly powerful because it allows them to transition from uh, you know, funding and campaign mode into commerce, which is their end goal. Um, so there's a lot of things that we do to help you not just reach your inner network, but your extended network. So friends of friends and future audiences out there in the world, which is incredibly important whether you're trying to reach your local audience or whether you're trying to reach um, a global audience. Um, and the third key to success is just making sure that um, you uh, have, uh, have an audience that actually cares. You know, some people come on Indiegogo and don't raise a dollar or raise very little. Um, and it actually becomes a learning experience that they were building a product or starting a business that no one actually wanted. Um, and that's okay. They actually were able to learn within a matter of you know, weeks that their idea didn't have any legs versus spending years and all their own savings and everything on an idea that was never going to see the light of day. So a lot of people use Indiegogo as a, way to, as a quick like, litmus test. Hey, is this, is this something that there's an appetite for or not? Um, and if you, there is an appetite for, then we've got the engine to help you unleash that uh, appetite acro across the world. So um, those are the three things, you know, great campaign, which means be authentic, uh, be yourself, uh, set a specific goal, and be transparent about what you're trying to achieve, why you're trying to achieve it, and any risks involved in that. Uh, be proactive, get the word out. Um, I do know actually campaigns that raise, that I think update every, uh, two to five days raise on average 200% more than campaigns that don't update their funders and customers. So it's very uh, beneficial to engage with your funders because they're helping you get that engine going. And then just make sure, or use this as a, as a way to uh, make sure you have an audience that actually cares. Cool, awesome, very helpful. Um, so perhaps a very, um, some extremely tactical advice. So Ali from Pennsylvania on Google Plus asks, video seems to be the most effective tool in a great crowdfunding campaign. What are your tips in regards to video content you could give? Sure, I would definitely um, show yourself and your team um, and speaking in as authentic a way as possible, even if being in front of the camera is not your favorite thing. Uh, sometimes being able to see that vulnerability in someone makes someone connect with you uh, much better than if a, you had a sexy voiceover with a salesy talk speaking. Um, I would definitely tell uh, your story. So how did you come to this problem that you're trying to solve and why are you so passionate about it? Um, and then I would show any kind of work that you have done to date, what is the progress that you've made and show that. Don't just talk about it, but show it. So if it's a prototype you've done, show it. If it's an actual, um, you know, several units you've built, show it. If it's a, a business you've started and you're already running a store and the, the money you're raising is to open up the next uh, branch or franchise, show the, the original store and bring in the customers that have already used your product um, and, love your, and love your product to give testimonials. Um, so again, just make everything as transparent as possible. And then finally, make the call to action very clear, which is, you know, we're raising $10,000 to put a down payment on our, you know, our new piece of equipment that we need to take our business to the next level, or um, wh whatever it is that you need, be transparent about that, say it, and uh, leave you leave your funders with a call to action, which is um, not asking for money. That's actually the biggest mistake people say is, please give me money. Any little bit counts. That's a very begging approach. It's it it pulls upon guilt, and guilt is only so strong of a motivator. But, rally, but rather make the call to action an invitation. Um, we want you to be part of this story. We want to be part, you to be part of this journey. Help us make this happen. Let's bring this idea to life together. Because um, that, that kind of approach, that invitation, is far more empowering uh, than guilt is, and it's far more exciting. And everybody likes to be invited to a party. <laughs> no one likes to be begged. So it's, it's that kind of uh, approach that works. And I think you, as a person, creating this idea uh, you don't want to beg because you're not begging for, for 
you know, you're not begging for begging's sake. You're actually trying to make something really happen that's big and meaningful. So speak that way, um, and you will attract people that want to jump on, uh, jump on your train. Cool, awesome. And um, so Anastasia from Google Plus asks, can you explain equity crowdfunding? If you can raise crowdfunding capital without giving up equity, why would you consider it? And also maybe can we expect Indiegogo's to be able to do this um, down the road? Sure, yeah. So actually my original vision for Indiegogo when I was, when I left finance, <laughs> um, my original vision was to create a way to, to raise money, to raise investment dollars in a more democratic way. Um, and so the difference between Indiegogo today and equity crowdfunding is the only thing, the only perk you can't offer on Indiegogo is uh, equity or profit participation or any kind of upside. Um, in the states, the law was passed a couple years ago to enable equity crowdfunding um, in part based on the success that we had had. And we, you know, we sent all of our case studies to the Obama administration and it helped get the law passed showing their stories of growth and people hiring people because they were able to access capital on Indiegogo when they were being rejected by banks or VCs weren't calling them back and, you know, were having a hard time getting that start. Um, and so today, now we're in a world where equity crowdfunding is going to happen in the near future, at least in the United States. It's already starting to happen across the rest of the world. This is where the rest of the world leads the U.S., I would say. Um, and so I think, you know, it's an unexplored territory. We'll see what happens when it actually is uh, permitted here. Um, I think it will open up a new uh, type of funder, the person that is purely motivated by profit. I don't think it will replace everybody else who, you know, the millions of people who are funding on Indiegogo and crowdfunding every day, they're motivated by other reasons and I don't think those people will be replaced. Um, but there could be a new form of funder out there that isn't, that is purely motivated by profit that might want to get involved. Um, I also think it could potentially open up um, even more investment locally. So. Um, you know, there's a lot of people like my mother, for example, who are, uh, you know, keeping their money out of the markets because they don't trust the, they don't trust pub the public markets, they don't trust Wall Street, uh, probably for good reason based on what happened in 2008. And so um, they have, you know, keep their money in savings, but they're, there are people like my mom who know what they know. My mom knows real estate. My mom knows, you know, she ran a business for 30 years, so she knows that industry she should be able to fund and invest in businesses in the, in the domains that she understands. And right now, um, there's no way to do that. So um, she lives vicariously through a lot of campaigns on Indiegogo instead. Um, but it would, might be a sweetener if she had the ability for, for equity. Um, so I think in, it, as, we, as Indiegogo approaches the possibility that this becomes um, a legal reality for us, we'll definitely lean in on it. It was definitely our original vision. We wanted to, to democratize access to capital. Um, by empowering people to fund what you know, whatever mattered to them, uh, whatever that was, wherever they are, and then however they'd like to fund, whether it's for perks or for for, for profit. And once uh, the regulations come out at the end of the year, we'll take a look at the business opportunity, figure if we can make a good business case uh, for it. Cool, awesome, Dave. Let's get you in here. You're raising a hundred million dollars <laughs> for your third investment fund. Last year, you announced you'd be you'd open a portion of that to raise to the credit of public via crowdfunding. What's been your experience so far? Well, uh, a lot of the reasons that we decided to uh, register for public fundraising was just to be able to talk about what we're doing. Uh, that's a pretty big change from how most venture capital and other people who are raising funds have operated for the last uh, 80 years, uh, really. Um, that said, I'm not sure that we're likely to raise money for our fund from the average person on the street. Actually, uh, usually we're looking for people to invest a half million to a million dollars and up. So that's not your typical uh, crowdfunding campaign. Um, we have had some investors come in through that method, and people who are interested can also check out our website at 500.co uh, slash invest and see information there. Um, because of the regulatory environment, we do have to make sure that our investors are accredited. Um, as Danae was saying, a lot of the uh, real sort of uh, democratization of crowdfunding capital is still uh, in process and legislation. But really for us, uh, the reason that we filed for public fundraising was just to be able to talk publicly about what we're doing, at least uh, when I'm on U.S. soil, uh, and really make it uh, clear to people. Um, so we have a pretty large audience on Twitter and other social media, and it, felt like we wouldn't really be being true to ourselves if we weren't able to talk about what we're doing to those people. Got it. And this question is for both of you. Um, start with you, Dave. Can entrepreneurs leverage both seed funding and crowdfunding to launch their companies? 
Yeah, absolutely, and I think that's becoming more and more a great tool. Um, like uh, Danae was saying, I think uh, using crowdfunding uh, sites um, as a way to test a lot of the ideas and products is uh, probably a, a great way to make sure that what you're doing actually has an audience. Uh, we have a company, Nomiku, uh, that does uh, online uh, campaigns for for their uh, cooking products. They run a, a business that actually uses uh, sous vide to uh, create home cooked products. Uh, I believe they've raised over a million dollars on a crowdfunding site. Um, so I think as much or more of their initial funding came from crowdfunding as it did from the investment community. Um, and the woman who's uh, the founder there has actually had two campaigns that were very successful. It also helped them get their product in the hands of a lot of their customers. Mm -hmm. Got it. And Danae, what do you think about the balance between seed funding and crowdfunding? I, I think they go hand in hand. I think um, there isn't necessarily a right order, like do crowdfunding first, then seed, do seed, then crowdfunding. Uh, we're seeing it go both ways, so it really, it really depends. Um, we've seen it uh, where people, for example, the Ghost Drone just used an Indiegogo campaign, and by the end of the campaign, they'd raised a $10 million round of venture funding uh, behind them, which is um, a great way to sh show that Indiegogo helped them kind of take the step towards the traditional route. We also have partnered with, um, you know, incubators like Hacksasia in Singapore, where they they do the seed funding first into a lot of their their products, um, and then they put them all on Indiegogo to help really refine the product, refine the product market fit, get the feedback from the funders and because cu they're customers. Um, when people are voting with their dollar, it's a much more powerful way to get real feedback and data uh, than any focus group could ever do. Um, and so we're seeing it. We're seeing it go seed, and then and then Indiegogo second. So it can it can happen both ways. It really just depends upon you and and what you're trying to achieve. Some people do Indiegogo, then seed, then Indiegogo, then you know we had Jibo, which was the world's first family robot. Uh, the the scientist behind that, she um, she she did an Indiegogo campaign, and I think she had gotten a commitment from a venture investor who was interested and. It, uh, some of the investment was um, contingent upon the success of the Indiegogo campaign. So we're seeing it all kind of mixed up, but I really think that um, what, what crowdfunding provides, the reason why it's thriving is because it can, it can provide, beyond, beyond money, um, it can provide mar data and market intelligence and feedback that is incredibly valuable in making a really good business and product. And it, those are elements that a, a traditional investor just can't provide. You know, their opinion is just an opinion um, about where their market. It's an educated opinion, but it's still a guess. And um, that's why uh, the value of, of crowdfunding is extending far beyond the money, and why traditional investors are now working with us, we're partnering with you know VCs and incubators and things like that to make the whole process seamless because of the of the market data and and the validation uh, benefits that that Indiegogo is bringing outside the money. Great. Cool. And so you talked a little bit about how equity crowdfunding could come to be soon. Can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit more about the future of crowdfunding and where do you see it going? Sure. <laughs> uh, it's here to stay. <laughs> I actually think in the future we're going to drop the word crowd. Um, it's, this is just a better, better way to fund. It's going to be all part of the funding ecosystem. Um, in a way, the world that we lived in before um, was kind of the world that Dave was alluding to, and uh, which you know it sounded like he wasn't happy about still, where only high net worth individuals have the ability and opportunity to to get to participate in investing directly into potentially uh, very nice investments. Well, in the future, we're going to live in a world where everyone has that opportunity. Um, and that's what equity crowdfunding will help bring. That's what we've kind of catalyzed through offering perk crowdfunding. Um, and then in the future, what will happen is, um, in, you know, crowdfunding and Indiegogo will become a permanent piece of the financial ecosystem. Um, there will be uh, what will evolve is um, because everyone participate, uh, the level of uh, education will have to increase. Um, in a way, a lot of a lot of regular people. Um, don't understand funding yet. They don't understand risk. They don't understand that it's actually not a guarantee. High net worth individuals who have a lot of experience investing, they understand that. But I think in the next, you know, two to five years, um, we're going to do a lot of work around educating regular people about what funding really means. Um, and so that will be a wonderful benefit uh, because that will will be what will be required for them pe for people to truly participate in an empowering way. Um, and then the next step after that is. 
what will happen is we'll essentially democratize, you know, great investors. So right now people will follow everything, you know, Dave McClure does and everything that John Doerr does because they're known to be incredible investors. Um, well, what if we could unlock, you know, the Mary Janes of the world or the people from all corners of the earth that don't get to sit in this in this world of, of investment and they get to come off and thrive as being the best, you know, eyes for for opportunities and so suddenly what we'll see is influencers coming on just like we've seen with you know with blogging democratized writing it used to be all uh, you know centered or all concentrated at newspapers and magazines well the internet democratized that and we have bloggers everywhere and we have people building careers off of blogging same thing will happen within Indiegogo and crowdfunding and the world of funding is that there will be people who create careers after helping find the best ideas and get the best ideas off the ground and then people will follow them so um, and that will be all open and transparent. Got it. Awesome. This is super insightful. Let's jump to the topic of accelerators. So Dave, you run one called 500 Startups. What does it take to join 500 Startups Accelerator? Uh, thanks. Well, we're looking for people who have a product that's already functional, uh, ideally that also has some customers or at least some users. A typical company that we might invest in is one that maybe is doing between five to fifty thousand dollars a month in revenue, uh, or that might have a hundred thousand to a million users if they're not generating revenue, uh, at least for a lot of free uh, applications. Um, we're interested in companies all over the world. Uh, we've invested in uh, people in over fifty countries, and uh, we're looking for a lot of really cool products, mostly in software uh, areas. Um, but also a lot of products that are helping make everyday lives uh, better with uh, use of technology. Cool, awesome. Um, there's a question for me on why did, so Homejoy went through Y Combinator and why did we join? What were your ben biggest benefits gained? So I think we joined for two reasons. One, for advice from partners, they're well experienced, and two, um, help in fundraising. And I think though in hindsight the biggest benefits we gained were one, it put us in a time box. It gave us pressure to deliver very fast results, and we kept up with that cadence um, till to up till to today and moving on. And two is a alumni network, and I think this is the same, especially for 500 startups too. Um, you you form tight friendships with a lot of folks there and who are fellow entrepreneurs, and it's just very very helpful down the road to get advice from and stuff like that. Yeah, I think um, the community is one of the biggest uh, benefits. Both Y Combinator and 500 Startups have two of the largest founder communities in the world. Uh, and probably a lot of the benefit of those networks is not the money, uh, sometimes not even the branding as much as it is the peer community of founders who uh, are working on their startups or have had both success and failure that they can share their experiences um, with new founders. Yep, exactly. Yeah. I, I just will echo community is so important. We um, we just saw a campaign go live on Indiegogo to raise money to save a an accelerator in the Gaza, of which 50% of of that yeah yeah it was amazing and it was it's really I mean entrepreneurship I I, I really think entrepreneurship and business is can be incredible. Uh, force for change and social good and help economies come back and things like that. So creating communities or, and accelerators help do that, um, bringing people together um, to really, you know, you need people to test your ideas and like say, you know, that's a crazy one, but this one over here, that was a pretty good idea, you know, go test that because you need to have that kind of open and free thinking and spirit of experimentation uh, for you to get to a good result. It's, you're not going to come up with it perfectly in your head on take on, on day one. Um, you have to test it and get it out there, get people helping you, giving you feedback, sharing that what they learned along the way um, to help accelerate the whole whole process. It's probably not an accident why it's called an accelerator. <laughs> Is um, Do you have a lot of the entrepreneurs who are fundraising on Indiegogo, are they connecting with each other? Are they talking to each other? Is that the community? That yeah, that we're seeing it happen organically and it's an opportunity for us that we're looking heavily at how can we accelerate that essentially? How can we catalyze that even further? I mean I've got um, you know people, one thing, a plug for Y Combinator, I gave a talk there and um, what they did a great job of is sharing their content and the, the education that they provide to the rest of the world and I started getting emails from Morocco and um, and I actually ended up meeting a Moroccan uh, entrepreneur that happened to watch the talk. I met him in Ireland at a conference I was at recently, and it all of a sudden I felt like we knew each other, even though you know we're from thousands of miles apart. But we all are thinking the same thing and just trying to make change in the world. And 
and it's it's uh, it's a really it's a really cool. Thing. So, yeah, yeah, we're working on it. Cool, awesome. And for those of you who don't know, the talk she's referring to is the startup school talk from yeah. this past mm -hmm. um, year. Um, it was very good. Uh, I watched it. Cool, Dave. Um, so Wyatt B from Google Plus from Arizona asks. Why Combinator states that they assist with incorporation and they prefer that applicants arrive as an unincorporated blank slate. How do you suggest that unincorporated and unfunded startups protect IP prior to initial fund ra funding round and live launch, yet also prepare for being a good fit for programs such as Y Combinator and 500 startups? Uh, okay, so there's a lot of questions in there. Um, I think the reasons that both YC and 500 uh, prefer that people incorporate or reincorporate uh, once they join those programs is a lot of companies may start with legal structures that aren't uh, appropriate or easy for investors to work with. And so for both YC and 500, we like to use um, standard structures that exist in Silicon Valley. Uh, that said, we have 500 has invested in companies all over the world in a variety of different incorporations and structures. Uh, and some of them don't actually come to the US. Uh, with regard to intellectual property, um, I don't think that incorporation is necessarily the structure that's going to protect intellectual property. That's more based on patent and trademark and other issues that, in that sense. Um, but for us, I think as much as you know, intellectual property may be important, we're really looking for uh, the product and the customers to illustrate that the company has a lot of potential. Um, so for us, I mean, we're probably looking a lot more at the customer metrics and the business metrics than we are at whether there's intellectual property patents or other uh, trademarks in place. Those are helpful, but those probably don't necessarily uh, define the success of the business. Got it. Okay, cool. Um, and then Colby Wilcock from Utah on Google Plus asks, my partner and I are trying to figure out if we need more funding or if we should self-fund the growth we're trying to go through. Our biggest concern is that is about the control that comes with bringing on investors. How much control should we plan to lose? Yeah, so I think there's a lot of questions about control from uh, uh, people who are seeking investment. Um, it's, it's a relevant question, particularly once you start accepting capital from larger investors, uh, particularly greedy, uh, blood-sucking venture capitalists like myself and others even larger than us. Uh, and more comes with uh, board structure and board seats. Um, but probably for a lot of companies, um, really uh, initial investors coming in uh, probably don't have that much control. There's certainly some control that they have as a result of putting money into the business. But for most investors, we're really investing in the team and you know, we're not usually trying to take over the business. We're trying to invest in people we think have a uh, great vision for the future and products that are going to make people's lives better. Um, so really, a lot of the control issues come with board structure, uh, the legal structure that people are investigating. Uh, I would recommend getting you know lawyers to help explain how that works, uh, and then when you uh, particularly taking larger amounts of money from institutional investors and when they're taking board seats, uh, that's when control structures come into play quite a bit more. Got it. Awesome. Great. So maybe just one final question, um, Dana. Let's start with you. Knowing what you know now about fundraising, what is one piece of advice you would like to leave our viewers with? It's a great question. Um, knowing what I know about fundraising, <laughs> um, I would say uh, make sure. Well, this is always kind of my my main piece of advice to to any entrepreneur I meet is is really know your why. Why are you starting this business? What is what is the mission that you're on, and why is you having to start a business? Um, the thing that's going to allow you to achieve that mission. A lot of people ask me, like, why did I become an entrepreneur? And I always say, well, I needed to fix this problem. It's called finance. It's broken. Only the rich keep getting richer and the poor stay poor. And opportunities, um, you know, are not are not equally distributed. And it's unfair. And it's pissing me off. And that I was obsessed with that. It, it, came, it comes from how I was raised. My parents are small business owners. They never got a break. They never could get a loan. I then started failing, trying to help filmmakers raise money myself because I didn't know the right people and I wasn't connected enough. And so it just became this ache in my brain that would not go away and actually kind of took over my body too. And I think that's been my why. And with a strong why um, or reason for being is another way to put it, um, that'll get you through fundraising. That'll get you through the low points in your 
in your startup life because there will be low points. Um, that'll lift you up in the high points, and it'll it'll determine your 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 vision. It'll determine your product. It'll actually even determine your customers. Like Indiegogo wanted to change the world. Every single customer on Indiegogo wants to change the world in their own way, whether it's having a better product or um, saving the world in, in creating a nonprofit or, or whatever, but there's this angst in every one of our customers about being unsettled um, about the status quo that is driving them, and I think it, it, it's, all, it's all related. It comes from where Indiegogo came from. And so I know you asked about fundraising, but that's like if you can make sure that, that your why is as, as strong and kind of deep as as possible. I always tell people do the five why exercise, like ask yourself why, why are you starting this company? And then you just have an answer and we'll ask why again and why again and keep going until you get to a completely irrational place. <laughs> and if you can get to an irrational place, then you're good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you just keep, if it comes back to well, I just want to make money or I just want to, you know, be an entrepreneur because it's cool to be an entrepreneur, it's not strong enough and you're not going to survive. It survive the journey because it, it is an arduous journey for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely knowing that question will help you raise money eventually. Um, and it will completely because that's what Dave was saying. They're looking for passion, people who are not going to give up. When you know, when we launched in in Indiegogo in January of 2008, our goal was to raise our first venture round in the fall of 2008. Well, that's when the stock market crashed and everything stopped. We didn't actually raise our first venture round until March 2011 which was three years later. And so I always call that 2008 to 2011 the dark period, but it was the period that just we were relentless and we knew it was going to work. It was just a matter of time and just a matter of patience and just a matter of iteration until we got it right. And so that's what helped us survive the dark period and I think that's what our investors saw in us. And they're like, these kids have like persevered. <laughs> like if they can do persevere that, they'll be able to figure out whatever they need to figure out in this unknown Uncharted waters called crowdfunding. So, awesome, great. And Dave, um, what's one piece of advice you can leave with our viewers with? Uh, I think some of the things that Dene said are actually really on target. Particularly the one about um, you know right now a lot of people glorify starting a business and startup is pretty much uh, even sexier than starting a rock band. <laughs> um, but. Uh, you know, starting a company is hard and actually takes uh, time and effort to build. Um, I think really the most important thing we always tell people is to focus on what your customers' needs are. Um, and it's not always just about passion. I think it's important that you actually have a real business. And, you know, we're not always investing in people who just want to make money, but making money is an important, you know, economic test for whether the business is sustainable and survivable. So we want you know, equal parts people who are passionate, uh, whether that's about solving customer problems or about making money. And the ultimate test of that business is it's got to you know, make money at some point or be worth something to somebody else. Um, so I, I would say probably not to expect that uh, doing a startup is really the most fun thing in the world. Um, you really do have to be you know, hard-nosed and focused on what you're doing. You have to be passionate and sometimes crazy about it and really the biggest test of whether it's working or not is whether customers will use your product and pay for it. Got it. Awesome. Great. Well, that's all the time we have for now. Uh, thanks so much for, um, to Danae and, and Dave for joining us. Um, thanks for having us. Great. <laughs> it's fun. If I can get uh, one last plug in, our sure. applications are open for our next uh, Accelerator Batch 13, Lucky Batch 13. Uh, and you can apply on AngelList at angel.co slash 500 startups. Cool. Awesome. Um, great. That was very insightful. I uh, want to thank the fine folks at Google and Virgin Unite for setting this up. Thanks, everyone, for participating on Google Plus and Twitter. Um, until the next broadcast, good luck to everyone if you're fundraising or starting your own thing. Um, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>